Hello, welcome to 8.9 News. I'm Finn Locustain. A new book, Timber, How Wood Can Help Save the World from Climate Breakdown, will be published in June this year. It's by Paul Brannan, the Director of Public Affairs for the European Confederation of Woodworking Industries. He says that planting trees is not enough to prevent the climate crisis. We also have to chop them down. I asked him what he means. Well, I know it sounds alarming, um, but the context is we're facing climate breakdown. And there's two big things we need to do, and we need to do them simultaneously. So one is we need to uh, reduce our emissions of carbon into the atmosphere. And we also need to remove carbon from the atmosphere. And trees are fantastic at removing carbon from the atmosphere. So while they're growing, growing in the forest, their process of photosynthesis means they're taking in the CO2 and they're storing it. And they're great at that. Um, But they have a life cycle. And early in their lives, they take in a little bit. In middle age, they take in a lot. And when they reach old age, they slow down considerably stop taking in the CO2 and eventually will die, fall over and release the CO2 back into the atmosphere, which is what we don't want. So by harvesting, felling the trees um, as they reach the end of middle age and taking the timber, which continues to store the carbon and moving that timber into the built environment, then we are able to go on storing the carbon that was stored in the forest. Mm -hmm. And the key thing, the key thing is that we obviously need to replant or allow natural regrowth of the forest once we fell the trees so that our forest stock stays as high as it currently is and ideally expands. And I'm very much talking in the book about the European context um, and the North American context. I'm not talking about uh, South America and the rainforest. I'm talking about northern forests and how we need to use them in the same way as a, a farmer does. You know, no one complains when the farmer harvests at the end of the year the wheat crop. No one protests about that, saying save the wheat because it's um, a renewable, sustainable process. It will be planted again the following year. Forests are on a longer time scale. We're talking 30, 40 years before we fell, harvest and then replant. But that that's the process. And as a result of this, uh, we should be able to increase the amount of carbon stored in timber in the built environment to the extent that in 30, 40, 50 years time, we could have as much carbon stored in the timber in the built environment of our cities as we do in the forests that surround our cities. When you're talking about forests, I'm imagining plantations. Are we talking mostly about conifers or are there deciduous trees as well? Both in the European context and both in the North American context. I think in the UK context, we're talking primarily here about conifers. So we're talking about the likes of Kielder Forest in the Thumbland up on the Scottish border, a man-made forest planted uh, predominantly after the Second World War. Uh, growing relatively quickly compared to uh, the deciduous trees. So, yes, you could call them plantation forests. We don't tend to talk about them in that way in the UK, but uh, a man-made planted forest of conifers. And in the UK at the moment, there's roughly a 50-50 split between conifers um, and deciduous. But we do use our hardwoods, maybe not as much as we could. And certainly in the likes of Germany, Germany and Austria, they're using their hardwoods. Uh, particularly in 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 the furniture industry, but uh, for most of the construction purposes, where the bulk of timber goes, um, it's the softwoods, it's the conifers uh, that we will need, we need, and we will need more of going forward. Well, and let's think worth... about construction for just a moment. Which is to what extent can timber actually replace concrete and steel in the built environment? I mean, in terms of scale, are we likely to be constructing the equivalent of the Severn Bridge from timber anytime soon? <laughs> Well, good question. Um, If you look at the United States, um, Canada, Scotland, most of the Nordics in most places in the Nordics, then 80 percent plus of family homes are timber frame. That's the structural material. Weirdly, in England, it's the other way around. More than 80 percent are not timber framed. Um, So the family house in the suburban and rural area can be built Uh, with a timber frame as the structural material. So it's happening and we need to do it more, particularly in England. Now, if we move into the cities um, where housing is denser, buildings are bigger, there has been a tendency in the last 100 years for the dominant material to be concrete, concrete and steel. And until relatively recently, timber wasn't able to replace that, but it is now. 
And the reason for that is we have a material known as engineered timber in Europe or mass timber in the United States, which is a kind of grown up version of plywood where you stick the pieces of wood together at right angles and you can create a material could be cross laminated timber um, or laminated veneered lumber or glue lamb. And these materials have the structural strength of steel and concrete. And as a result, we are able to build at height and scale with timber. So in 2009, um, in London, we had a Murray Grove, which was a cross laminated timber building, first uh, engineered timber building in London. And that went up to nine stories. Um, and now Norway, Austria, they've gone up to 18 stories with engineered timber. So we can now build big buildings out of timber. So probably we won't be building in the near future bridges, um, but the vast majority of the built environment, certainly up to uh, 20, 30 stories, can now and in future be built from timber. That's interesting. Now, a lot of architects, of course, seem to value big, tall buildings from Canary Wharf to London's Gherkin, which are certainly higher than 20 stories. Do you think that we need to start reconstructing our expectations of building scale and indeed our conception of built beauty? To some extent, I think I think the context here is this expanding global population. I mean, in 2020, what did we have? We had, um, was it 6 billion people? And we're now up to 8 billion uh, by 2050. Now, most of those people will live in an urban environment and many of them will live in one of the big super cities. I mean, in the case of the UK, we're talking London. That is a premier city with a fast, still with an expanding population. And we have a kind of choice, really. Either we're going to house them by building buildings which spread out into the countryside and eat into the green belt. Or we go up. Um, and I think a lot of a lot of us, myself included, would favor we need to have more people living in taller buildings going forwards. Now, I think to some extent, the the over 20, over 30 stories is a bit of a red herring. The that will be always be a minority of the population living in the very tall buildings. Most people um, in future will live in a mid rise build in our cities. Uh, particularly the super cities. So we're talking about eight, 10, 15, 20 stories. And Wood is perfectly capable of delivering that. Just taking a step back and thinking about supply, is all this timber going to come from forests? I'm wondering to what extent recycling can play its part. Well, it's a combination uh, of where it will come from. I Part of the reason for writing the book was this was a question that was coming up more and more. I was finding that if you make the case for building more with wood, then people get it, they get the climate benefits, and then they ask, but is there enough wood? Mm -hmm. And the scale of which we could expand the use of wood construction, and in particular, the use of wood fiber insulation. All of our buildings need to be better insulated, both for the winter to do with the cold, but also increasingly for the summer to do with the heat. That insulation at the moment is predominantly fossil fuel based. So we need to switch into a nature based material and wood would be absolutely wood fibers, absolutely ideal for that. So when we're talking about two massive increases in the need for wood, one to build with and two to insulate with. So where's it going to come from? So our forests in Europe have been expanding. So there is a growing sustainable wood supply um, in a European context. So that's good news. In the UK, we've been standing still very slow progress on planting any more both particularly planting more commercial wood in the UK, although there is political support for it, it seems difficult to do. So we've got to unlock that somehow so we can expand uh, our forest cover. We need to use better, more efficiently the wood that we already have. I visited a sawmill in northern France recently. They're using X-ray machines. Uh, they're using CT scans to optimize how to cut the wood so that we can maximize the timber coming out each of each of the tree trunks. So there's that material efficiency. We need to build better by using less wood. So we mustn't um, over specify, um, don't build a great big thick wooden wall if a thinner wheel wooden wall would do in simple terms. Um, but yes, we need to reuse wood. Um, we've had the first building go up in London recently, which has been designed to be disassembled and reused. So design for 
reuse, very important. Coming more of that will come through. And ultimately, we need to recycle more wood. We do quite a lot of recycling of wood. It varies from country to country. The Italians are excellent at it. We in the UK are fairly good, but could be better. And that recycled wood can go into new wood products. So you take an existing wood product, you recycle it, and you can make particularly panels. So if you think of furniture from IKEA, that kind of uh, chipboard material is made can be made entirely from recycled wood. So recycling will also be important as well. Now, just finally, there's such a demand for land in places like the United Kingdom. How do you think we balance the need for timber with the need for good food and indeed space for nature? Again, this was part of the reason for writing the book was because there is a tendency to think it's an either or. So if we plant more trees, that means we'll have less farmland, therefore means we'll have less food. And it absolutely doesn't need to be like that. There are multiple win-wins we can exercise here. So, for example, that issue of do we grow food or do, do we grow trees? Growing body of evidence um, falling under the title agroforestry is that you can insert up to 10% trees on farmland and still produce the same amount of food from that land. And you can do that with both animals and with crops. Um, and we'll, it's not just happening in the UK, albeit slowly, it's happening in Europe and it's been happening in Australia as well. So there's various examples in the book of how we can still maintain the level of food production we have and increase the amount of trees that we plant. The other win-win is wherever you do put trees, you increase biodiversity. So if you put more trees on farms, you'll have my, more biodiversity on farms. Um, and we don't have to do these trade-offs necessarily between biodiversity and wood production or between wood production and food production. We can do them simultaneously. And what we really do need here, particularly in England, is we need a land use strategy because at the moment we're dealing with issues in silos, um, which is absolutely not the way to approach things. And we need to look at things in a cross-cutting way. Scotland has a land use strategy and it really is time that England now had a land use strategy too. That was Paul Brannan, the author of Timber, which can be pre-ordered from Waterstones and Blackwells now. More news on our website, 8.9.com. That's all for now. We're back soon. Thanks for watching.